Hello everyone, good morning and welcome to this Sunday's Act of Worship and thank you for being with us. We're the churches of the North Mills Team Ministry here in Southport but if it is you live elsewhere you're very welcome and I hope you enjoy this time of worship and fellowship. We're joined this morning by our team rector, Rebecca, and one of our lay readers, Roger Abram. As you will hear shortly, uh, the set Bible reading for today is from John's Gospel, chapter 2. And it is that account of Jesus being at the wedding of a family friend in the village of Cana in Galilee. And so our thoughts this morning are directed toward marriage and the coming together of family and friends in a time of joy and celebration. And so at the beginning of our time of worship, let us pray. Firstly, a prayer in which we give thanks for marriage. Eternal God, author of harmony and happiness, we thank you for the gift of marriage in which men and women seek and find fulfilment, companionship, and the blessing of family life. Give patience to those who look forward to marriage. Give courage to those who face trials within their marriage. Give comfort to those whose marriages are broken. Give gratitude to those whose marriages are successful and fruitful, and let their lives reflect your love and your glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God of love, bless those preparing for marriage who seek your help and guidance for their new life which they begin together. Unite them evermore in your love, keep them faithful to the vows they will make, enrich them in their married life with every good gift, and let your peace be with them now and always, for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. During these months of the pandemic, couples who have spent many long hours planning and preparing for their wedding day have had all their plans thrown into disarray. Up to the present lockdown, weddings were allowed, but only 15 people were to be present. Now, in this period of lockdown, weddings are only permitted in exceptional circumstances. How deeply disappointing that must be for couples. They look forward so much to that celebration with family and friends. Now all that has to be postponed. As we will see in our Bible reading, there were no such restrictions at the wedding that Jesus attended at Cana in Galilee. A good thing really because the Bible tells us there that Jesus and his disciples and his mother were attending. That makes up a party of 14, just from their own group. If we could identify the most popular hymn chosen by wedding couples down through the years, it would probably be the hymn Love Divine or Love's Excelling. Maybe that is the hymn that you chose for your wedding. Oh 
a Jewish wedding, much more perhaps than a Christian wedding, is full of ritual, tradition and symbolism. I want to show you now an American couple, Daniel and Madeline Mark, explaining to us the traditions that accompany a Jewish Orthodox wedding today. But such are these ancient marriage traditions that I suppose they would have been much the same at the wedding that Jesus attended in Cana. I'm Danielle Mark. I'm Madeline Mark. Uh, we got married just about a year ago, almost exactly. It's important to find someone to build a life with together, to raise children and to pass on the tradition to them, which is really the heart uh, of what Jews do. And of course, marriage and the traditional family is the only place for that to happen. It is typical and traditional for a bride and groom to fast on the day of their wedding. It's almost as though they're starting their life anew with a clean slate. The wedding typically starts with the bride and groom each receiving guests in separate rooms. So the groom has what's called a tish and the bride has what's called kabbalat panim. There's the wedding document, the ketubah, that's filled in and prepared during the reception of guests before the wedding ceremony and then given by the groom to the bride during the wedding ceremony. The smashing of the plate symbolizes the irreversible nature of what the bride and groom are about to undertake. So just as you can't put a plate back together after you smash it, so too you can't undo what you're about to do. And then the groom is brought in uh, to the bride to put the veil over the bride and that's called the bedeckin. The groom will be uh, danced in uh, to see the bride where he will put a veil over her and she will receive a blessing from her father. It is usually the first moment that the bride and groom are also seeing each other after a whole week of separation. And then the groom is danced back out uh, and then people line up uh, for the marriage ceremony. The groom goes up under the chabad, the wedding canopy, and then um, the bride is brought up to him separately. And the idea behind that is that the chabad symbolizes the groom's house and he brings the bride into his home. Immediately after the bride is escorted to the groom, uh, she walks around him seven times. Just as Joshua and the Israelites circled around Jericho seven times, so too the bride walks around the groom seven times to break down any walls between them to show that they're a unified couple. And the bride is symbolically putting up a wall between their relationship and the rest of the world. At the wedding ceremony, there's actually a series of blessings. There's a blessing that we say over the wine, but also a blessing over the betrothal. And then later, uh, there's a series of seven blessings that are said, and these are um, the marriage blessings that we use as well at the grace after meals. Typically, different honored guests, family members, rabbis, are called up one by one to take turns reciting each of these seven blessings over the cup of wine. During the ceremony, the groom gives the bride a ring, but the bride does not give the groom a ring. And the symbolism behind a ring is that it's a simple, unbroken band with no adornment. And this symbolizes the unbroken nature of their relationship um, and the simplicity of it as well. Once the ceremony is entirely complete, the groom has just a little bit of ash put on his head um, and then breaks a glass. And that's because as Jews, we recognize that even at the peak of our joy, we mourn, our joy is incomplete because the temple is not standing in Jerusalem. It has been destroyed for 2,000 years because the Jewish people have not been redeemed. After the ceremony, after the groom breaks the glass, um, they're escorted with much singing and dancing to a private room where they have their f first few private moments as a married couple together. And then the party starts. And that's because there's an obligation uh, to celebrate this joyous communal occasion. And what's unique to a wedding and to the week of festive meals that follow the wedding is that the seven blessings that are recited under the wedding canopy during the ceremony are also said at the conclusion of the grace after meals. And these are beautiful blessings that invoke the participation in the couple of building the world with God and look forward to the joy, not just of the home they will build, but of the redemption of the Jewish people. And now Roger brings us our Bible reading 
and then Rebecca will share with us her reflections on that wedding at Cana in Galilee. Today's Gospel is taken from St John's Gospel, chapter 2, beginning to read at verse 1. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from twenty to thirty gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's lovely to be able to share with you a short reflection on the wedding at Cana that we find in John's Gospel. So as you can imagine, as a vicar, I've married many couples and I always enjoy a good wedding. But each wedding is very personal to that particular couple and quite unique. On the day of the actual wedding, there is often a sense of excitement in the air as everyone gathers. And it has to be said, there is nearly always a bit of nervousness between the bride and the groom which I'm very glad to say soon disappears once the service begins. And as they leave the church as husband and wife, there is a deep sense of joy and happiness for everyone. It's all simply fantastic. And that's why I love the idea of Jesus going to a little village wedding and having a good time. I like that image of Jesus letting his hair down, so to speak and enjoying the company of family and friends. It's not an image that we often think about, but Jesus, I think, had a great sense of humour, and I imagine, too, that his laughter would set everyone else off. Why? Well, because we have a God who is so full of joy, who is so full of life, of hope, and of love. And so there has to be laughter and humour somewhere in this God of ours, in Jesus. And so the story which Roger read for us about the wedding in Cana is actually full of humour. A couple of years ago, I read this particular passage at a wedding I was taking. And when I got to the bit about Jesus turning water into wine, everyone in the church started to laugh. Then they stopped and looked very embarrassed, as if they shouldn't have been laughing at a story from the Bible. I immediately said, hey everyone, it's all right to laugh, for the author of John's Gospel expected people to laugh at the telling of this story, because let's face it, in parts of it, it's simply bonkers. Turning water into wine, well, it's no mean feat, that's for sure. But it's the sheer quantity of water that was turned into wine. It's laughable that Jesus would take six stone water jars filled with water, the equivalent of 180 gallons, 
and then produce 180 gallons worth of wine. You know, it's simply crazy, isn't it? So why do it at all? What's it all about? I mean, you know, there is having a good time and there is having a good time. This whole story has so many different levels of meaning, that's for sure, which is, you know, quite typical of John's Gospel. But things are never quite what they seem in the Gospel of John. There are so many different strands running backwards and forwards, connecting and seemingly disconnecting, but actually continuing to be connected. So water into wine? Well, let's unravel it just a little bit. A simple, profound truth lies at the heart of this. And it is this. In such a miracle, it's almost that Jesus is saying to us, look at this, look at this. I've turned water into wine. And yes, it's crazy. Yes, it's bonkers. Yes, it's way beyond what was needed. Almost laughable. But this is the kind of God that I am. Extravagant in all my giving. Many times in John's Gospel, we see Jesus being that extravagant person, that extravagant God. In the feeding of over 5,000 people. With what? With five loaves and two fish. Inviting us to come to him with the promise that, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. And out of his heart, shall flow streams of living water. And when things are grim, as they certainly have been during the last year, there is a promise of light. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness and will have the light of life. All this and so much more Jesus offers to you and to me. All we need to do is ask for what we need. And then ironically, we discover that Jesus has already been there for us, there just when we needed him. That, my friends, is the wonder and the joy of having such a God as this in our midst, not distant, not distant, but right here with us. Finally, remember the turning of water into wine was the first of many of the miracles we recorded in the Gospel of John. This was the first of the signs, as John puts it, to reveal God's glory, something Jesus was to do every day and every moment of his life. And in the revealing of God's glory, Jesus gives us a glimpse into the heart of God, for it is the place of unconditional love. And right there, in the very centre of God's being, we are held, held in the love of God, loved by God unconditionally. Hard I know for some of us to accept. It's a truth I struggle with. It's tough believing that we are loved in such a way. But you know, we are. For in Jesus, we have the offer of abundant life, of sins forgiven, a God who is full of joy, of hope, and laughter. This is Jesus, our God, yours and mine, who, when he went to a wedding in a little village called Cana, changed everyone and everything for the better. Amen. Our next hymn is again a popular hymn chosen for weddings in church. Leaders, Heavenly Father, leaders, all the world's tempestuous sea.
And now Roger will lead us in our prayers. As we come to our time of prayer, let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we recall Jesus' miracle of water into wine, may we each, every day, appreciate the signs of your divinity, the answered prayers, the capability with which we are all endowed, and especially at this time the unstinting, caring work of doctors and nurses, and the marvel of medical science in the development of COVID-19 vaccines. Father, as the wise men brought their gifts to the infant king, we ask you that in these unprecedented times we may seek existing and innovative ways of using our gifts in your service. And so, Lord, when we are again able to take the wine at Holy Communion, may we see ourselves as guests at the Cana wedding as we perceive Jesus' glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, you order all things for our eternal good. Mercifully inform our minds and give us a firm and abiding trust in your love and care for each one of us. Silence our murmurings, quiet our fears and dispel our doubts that rising above all our afflictions and our anxieties, particularly during this pandemic, that we may totally rest on you, our rock of everlasting strength. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Heavenly Father, with so many suffering from COVID-19, whether in hospital, nursing, care homes or in their own homes, we pray for all who are separated from their loved ones and from the lives they normally lead and the fear of what must lie ahead of them. We ask you, Lord, to bring healing and wholeness by your unending grace to them and all who are troubled at this time, whether in mind, body or spirit. And in a moment of silence, we bring before God any particularly known to ourselves. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord of love, we rejoice with the disciples and all your saints in the joy of the risen Lord. We ask you to bless all our loved ones departed with the fullness of your light and peace. Amen. And so shall we join together in the traditional words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Roger. Our closing hymn now is one that looks forward in faith and hope and with a sense of assurance that our God is with us. Lord of all hopefulness, Lord of all joy.
So as our service together comes to an end, it is a great privilege for me to offer the blessing, a blessing for all of you at home watching this service, a blessing too that can reach out to your families and friends during these difficult times. It's a blessing that holds with it a sense of hope. So Christ, the Son of God, perfect in you the image of his glory and gladden your hearts with the good news of his kingdom and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.